All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for, thanks for coming to OJUG today, especially for this talk, um, kind of a last minute, something I've been working on for a while, but we were looking for talks and um, came up to kind of drop the ball a little bit on scheduling that. So today I'm going to talk about closure. <laughs> First, I want to thank our sponsors, Tech Systems for Pizza and Food, food and wa Water Drinks, um, Agape Red for sponsoring one round of drinks afterwards, OPI for spon sponsoring our meetup group, meetup.com, and I think, am I missing anybody? Oh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, yeah. <laughs> I, knew, I knew there was something huge, thanks. You're all co-organizers co now. Um, so today I'm gonna give, a, it's kind of interesting to introduce myself on behalf yeah, of myself. Was completely awesome. <laughs> You really should listen to him and have some fun following the links that he suggests tonight. Closure, it's not just for last minute talks, it's for hobby projects. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thanks. Oh, um, all right. So have I got it. No. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. All right. Can you hear me over the. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay, so um, my name's Juan Vasquez. Uh, you can find me at javasquez.com or on GitHub as um, javasquez. So normally I'm some avatar that has a Lego face on it. So if you see that around here, that's pretty much going to be me. So we'll get started. Uh, closure. It's a lisp. I think everyone familiar with a lisp to some degree know of it, heard of it? Okay. Um, I always have trouble saying this. Is home, homeo iconic? I cannot, I cannot, I see, I'm already stumbling over it. That word, it's awesome. So Lisp is the second oldest language in widespread use today. Only Fortran is older by a year, uh, Wikipedia. Some of the flavors of Lisp that uh, have been around prior to closure is like Common Lisp and Emacs Lisp. Um, those are the ones that I've played around with um, from computer science and beyond. Um, you know, the first thing to address is uh, parentheses, right? Closure uses less parentheses than other lisps, and I'll show that. If you're familiar with other lisps, you'll see that. Um, but more than Java, right? More parentheses than Java. All right, so here's the definition. Pretty long. Essentially, uh, what it boils down to is code is data, and we'll talk a little bit about that. If, and I have just this example here where um, you can see in Lisp, everything's a, li a list, L-I-S-T. And the first thing is a function, or can be a function. Um, doesn't always be the case, but for a form, and we'll talk more about that later, this, is the oper this will operate on the rest of the list. So this is a data structure. The code is a data structure. The list is that data structure, and the code fits in the parameters of a data structure. So it gets to be a pretty powerful tool. Um, as everything's an expression. One of the things I'll show is an if statement is actually an expression, whereas in Java you can't assign a variable to an if statement other than a ternary operator. But things like that make it pretty powerful in, in a Lisp that you don't even think about as you get used to it. Uh, REPL, read, evaluate, print, loop. Um, I'll show, I usually have a couple of those running, and let me see. Essentially it allows you to Enter in commands, so I'll just run the documentation command for um, map. It's an interactive way to test your code out while you're writing. I typically will do it within my editor, editor Emacs, but you, as you start out, the first thing I did was fired up the REPL from the build tool called Line Again, and you just say line REPL, and it pulls it up, and uh, you can work with it there, but it's kind of limited in that you can't do all the cool cut and paste kind of functions or up arrows, that, you know, get history, that sort of thing. But as you start out, you could use that. Or um, there is this try closure where you, you get an interactive one, and I can do the same thing where I ask for it. So if you want to try things out, there's a iOS app. Since I have iOS, I know of it. I don't know if there's one for Android called Replete. Is that right, Jeff? And you can write code on your, on your phone just to test things out. I do that when I'm waiting in the doctor's office or something for my kids. Um, 
Oops, we'll get to that. So reevaluate print loop. I believe Java 9 is going to introduce a REPL. So if you haven't experienced one to date, you're going to be getting one in some near future here. Um, so that'll be a fun thing to have added. Um, some editors, Emacs, um, for, for those that like Vim, Space Max is Emacs with Vim first, first class. So you, you run that. And Jeff Fox is, is someone that I ask questions about um, for Space Max. But I've been using Emacs. Idea has something called. Um, What's ideas? Cursive. Cursive, thank you. Um, so you, if you're an idea fan, you can pull in cursive. And uh, it's pretty powerful to play around with Clojure. That's, um, if, here's some links here If when I send the slides out. Um, some setups, if you wanted to do the Emacs setups, you can just download some. This is what I used. I based my Emacs config off of this and made a few changes for myself. But you could basically take that down and then fire up your uh, Emacs session without having to go through the initial pains of figuring out how to set it up. But once you get it going from set, when you should, once you get it down and you're running it, it feels good rather than having to build the thing before you get to play with it. That's kind of, I, I don't know, weird that way. I need, to, I need to have it working before I build the thing. Uh, line again, this is the build tool that I'll be using. Um, there's a site. You can install it with Brew. Once it's on, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. The commands are just line, create new. And I'll show an example of that. Um, syntax. So everything's a lisp. And the first thing is a function position followed by arguments, which could be other functions. Um, this is all prefix notation in that your functions go before. You don't do it in line like you would say 1 plus 2. You would say plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, comments, they're usually written with a semicolon. They're written, they're written with a semicolon, but they can be written with, I usually see them with 2. Uh, and so I've adopted that. Code comments are, and I'll show an example of this, pound sign underscore. So that will actually, as you start seeing these lists, you can come out, come in out at that list level. So if you've got some code in there that you're playing around with, but you, I have some commitment issues. So I don't like to delete my code because I don't want to lose it sometimes when I'm kind of working around, playing around some stuff. So I'll, I'll actually comment out a, blo a whole block, a whole swath of of what I'm working with and write in a, a little couple lines to figure something else out. And if I don't need it, I delete it. But the, the, this way of commenting out, um, even within nested structures, you can just put a comment in. And at any level that you want to not evaluate, you can do that. Um, commas themselves are white space. So you'll see them usually when someone's defining a map. So to kind of show the grouping of the two, but you don't have to. Um, you wouldn't see them normally in a, a list or a, a vector. Um, rational numbers are first class. So if we take this here and we want to try closure, you get three fourths. That was something that kind of blew me away the first time I, I played with uh, closure. Uh, and so we could do put this little factorial and then <coughs> we can run that code here 24 so the interesting thing is uh, all I've done is taken a bunch of parameters to factorial can you read that okay do I need to blow it up any okay um, and I've defined a function that will wrap all of its arguments into a, a collection and then I'm reducing that collection by applying the multiplication. And so I get factorial out of that. So take all these numbers, throw them into a collection via this ampersand, and call it rest. And then reduce that rest, reduce that list down, and give me you know, what the 1 times 2, that's 2, times 3, right? then times that by 4. So if you're not familiar with reduce, that, that's how um, that works on that. And we'll talk more about that, those concepts as we get further. So those are, that's the syntax. Um, congratulations, you now know like 90% of how to write closure code. List, yeah. So if you change that 4 to a 5, then it's worth for now 30, right? Yeah. So it would, here, let's do it. Yeah. That's what you were looking for, right? OK. Thought you were tricking me here. I thought I was waiting for the hook to grab me. It's more factorial. It's just 
that's just multiplication, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I misnamed it. I have trouble with naming, so. It's hard. It's, it's hard, yeah, it's hard, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, you define, there's not, there's, it's hard coming from Groovy, which is my other favorite language when I'm not doing closure, and thinking about variables in, um, because they're all mutable within Groovy, and closure takes this immutable approach. So when you define vars, they call them, um, vars are not variable. And you use the, the keyword def in that function position and def minus um, to do that. Def defines a top level var. Um, you could think of it as a constant at the top level. You would never do that. You would never define, use def within a function. You would use a local binding like let. So if you've worked with uh, some of the mo modern JavaScript, what I'm seeing now is that that let statement is basically looking like what I've been doing with Clojure um, for the, the number of years that I've been playing with Clojure. So this is what I'm defining a var called my var, right? I gave it that list. Um, and then I can just ask it for it, my var, right? So that's, that's def. Yeah. You mentioned that. So is there a way to create the mutable variables? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about that, um, because that would be a whole other talk to get into. But Clojure offers four ways to do that. Um, and when we get there, I'll point it out within the slides. Um, def versus def n minus. Def creates public functions. Um, def n creates private functions. And there, there's pseudo-private in that you could still get to them, but you have to use um, the explicit namespace to get there. So when you're writing tests, um, you have to use the namespace of where it is, essentially the class name and then um, the function that you want to use. So if you're using those outside of actually be being the person building them, I would say don't do that because they're, they're private for a reason. Um, but hey, people do it. <laughs> YOLO, right? Uh, code is data. When code is written using data structures and expressions, that was what I was talking to a little earlier. And then here's a little thing on expressions. <coughs> All code is made up of expressions. Lists are called symbolic expressions, or S expressions for short. You'll see that, you'll also see down there at the bottom that S expression, S, S, S sex P, sometimes people will call it for short. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many jokes you can go there, but we won't. Um, one, two, three is an expression, right? And that, that was, that's kind of interesting. Uh, if true, if test true, false, that's an expression and that evaluates and returns something that you can assign to it. Um, we saw earlier the multiplication. Um, if only conditional operator. If is the only conditional operator in closure. Sorry. You start with if, and then you have cond. You have some conditional operators, but I think they all somehow build off if. It macro. I'm sorry? It macro. Oh, right, right. Cons and macro. If is a conditional operator. Thank you. Yes, you're correct. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, forms. So a valid S expression is called a form. Uh, one, two, three, four within that list is not considered a form because the REPL will generate an error as it will try to evaluate one as a function, but it, is still, it still is a list and it's still able to be evaluated. So this example here says how I can take from this list, take two, and take is a lazy function and we'll talk a little bit about laziness here. So yeah, I, I get the first two, but this quote right here is is something that um, we'll talk to a little bit. It will stop closure from evaluating the next structure. So if you do just the, the one, two, three, and parents in that, we'll do an error. Right? Yeah, and I'll, I'll show that here. Right, because long can't be cast to a function. Um, the, the other thing, too, is the, the parentheses um, can, you don't have to, well, it would be more verbose, but you could do this. List is a function that creates a list. Crazy, right? Um, sorry, what was that, Jeff? Uppercase L. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
but you know, four characters, that's too much. I can't, I can't handle it. I want concise code. <coughs> but it's there if you, if you like typing. Um, definitely use it. It comes in handy when you're creating functions that want, you want to generate other functions. That, that capability is actually pretty useful. I make some jokes here, but I've used it quite a bit in the past. <coughs> Keywords. They evaluate to themselves. Um, they're prefixed with the colon, and they are functions. So in this case, I'm defining a map, which um, hash map sort of, I would co correlate it to a hash map, but it's a little bit more powerful than that. Um, so we'll do this here, and then we can evaluate name uh, on its own, and it evaluates to itself. Um, but name is also a function. Given a map, a name will try, will tr attempt to pull its value out of that map. It's not there. Why didn't I do that? Interesting. Let's try this. Let's do name. There we go. So it's a function that's acting on this map that's returning back the name. What's my map The same. I don't know what's happening here. Oh, um. Why didn't it work? Yeah, I don't understand what's happening there. Must be, oh, is this? The, no, I think it's the, rep, the REPLs having issues here. Uh, is, do you need to use, so when you created the object, it has this sandbox 1663, <coughs> do you need to use it when you're trying to use We could, we could see if that does it. <coughs> Nope, it's not doing it for us. That's all right. Well, oh, colon, you think? All right, let's see. You think, wait, based on what we saw up here. Uh, I don't see a colon in front of it. Sorry, what were you saying? Uh, parentheses, colon name, and colon my name, parentheses close, would, what would that do? Oh, here you mean put a parentheses around this? Is this what you're saying here? Yeah, remove that and put a colon there. Put colon here? Remove all that. Okay, <laughs> you want to do it this way? Okay. Wrong args park to my map. Not just my map at all. You mean take off the parentheses here? You mean take off the sandbox 16. Oh, got it. All right, thank you. Nope. Symbols, all right. Symbols are similar to keywords. Um, they're essentially, I think of them as aliases. They evaluate to the named value in current scope. So what we were seeing here was the symbol my map being tied to this namespace. <clears throat> and then here's some, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> some examples of some symbols, function names, local vars, plus multiplication, minus. Um, macros are also symbols, and we'll talk a little bit about macros, special forms. And then we talk about special forms, quote, syntactic sugar was the tick mark that I showed earlier. We wrap that around the list. Def's a special form. Let's also a special form. To your question on mutable data, here's a few. So you can re, you can create a var, and then you can, you could say like var my map that I did earlier, and you could say equals that original map, and then you could say that later def var or something else. But you didn't actually mutate that. You you created a new structure. You didn't actually mutate the orig original. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when you're working with closure. Agents, um, the, these all work in different ways. Adam's the one that I use the most. Um, and these all, when you use these, these force you to use constructs to mutate them. So swap, reset are a few that you'll use depending on which of, the, which of these tools you, 
that you're doing. It forces you to recognize that you're mutating state. There's also transients. So if you've got, I believe it's called transients, if you've got code and you know that you can optimize for speed by mutating a specific variable, there's something, that's, there's something called a transient that you could temporarily within your algorithm, and it, the closure will force you that you can't pull it outside of that, uh, outside of the space that you're using it, but um, transients are another way to your, in, increase your um, algorithm performance by mutating data in a specific way. So it explicitly has you, it has you explicitly state the parts that are mutating as part of the language. So being lazy, um, lazy programmer needs an even lazier language. It's not as lazy as Haskell. If anyone's worked with Haskell, Haskell like takes the cake on laziness, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but all of closure, closures have structures, and most of them are based on seekable. So it's, it's the library, it's the hierarchy of things. Seekable is um, a lazy, a lazy collection implementation type of thing. So if anyone's done FizzBuzz, this is my way of showing a different. This is a way of showing it using infinite lists um, and functional programming. So what's done here is the cycle will create an infinite list of whatever you've passed it. So I've given it a list of three things here, which is for FizzBuzz, um, the thir every third position in, so if you want one, two, three, three would be Fizz, six would be Fizz. Um, for buzzes, it's every fourth. So I've created two infinite lists of fizz, Fizzes and Buzzes. And then what I need to do to to answer the FizzBuzz question is go through a range of numbers from one to whatever that is, and then wherever appropriate, write FizzBuzz, and wherever the third and the fifth, one, two, three, four, five, five, sorry, third and fifth meet, you get FizzBuzz. So 15, um, 30, I think. And so I can show that here. But how I do that is I ma I'm mapping a function. This is an anonymous function here, also called the closure with a S um, or lambda function. And I'm mapping this function that takes three arguments because I'm going to pass it the infinite list of fizzes, the infinite list of buzzes, and then an infinite list of numerics, one to infinity. Iterate is another function that creates an infinite list. So I've got three infinite lists here. I'm going to pass them into this function. And then if they're blank, Right, I'm going to check these. If they're blank here, then I'm going to pass it. Z represents the, the number. So I already know if I've got two things that match that are blank, throw in the number. Um, if not, then concatenate the two that come in. So if it's fizz and blank, I get fizz. If it's fizz and buzz that collide, I get fizz buzz. So um, that's how I approach that problem. Uh, I tried this in Groovy like, when, the first, when I first heard about fizz buzz, and I think I was you know, probably wasn't as seasoned as a coder, but I was definitely pushing three times more code than what I had here. So um, this is pretty concise. And let's see if the REPL here will let me. Okay. All right, so let's just take 100 from Fizz. Oh, uh, we're gonna run into the same problem there. Let's go to this REPL then. Let's see if this will let me do it here. Damn it. All right, I messed it up here. There. All right, I think. All right, so, so we get the list of all the fizz up to 100. It doesn't care after 100, so it stops processing. Um, but there you go. Now, so Java Interopt, uh, well, as I was putting this together and telling folks that I'd be giving a talk on Clojure, one of the things they said, well, hey, the Java Interopt, what's that story like? Um, the things that, as I was learning Clojure and working with Java libraries, um, it was. I hadn't actually had to work with the dollar sign when I was looking for inner classes. And I've seen them when I was working with Groovy as it was generating things, the classes, you would see a dollar sign. I was like, oh, what is that all about? And um, for this, that's really used for inner classes. 
And so in order to get, like map entry is, a, is an example of when you would use a dollar sign if you needed to get to that specific class. Um, you can use the Java libraries by um, namespace slash um, constant. For this one, is mathpy. Since this is a string, you can do that to uppercase. And so since Clojure can actually run on JavaScript's VM as, as well as Java's, you have to be a little careful about what you're working with because that uppercase won't that won't work in, maybe that will work. There's some instances where that particular, that Java call that you're doing won't work on the JavaScript front end, and it'll tell you right away, but um, just be mindful of that. Um, system properties, yeah, these are just a few examples of what it would look like to use Java within Clojure script. Or, I'm sorry, Clojure. Any questions? Okay. Um, so functional programming, peer functions. Unique output for every, each unique input, and it should be repeatable. You shouldn't get a different answer, right? Um, I think w immutability. So in this case, let's going to do a, a local binding, and I'm going to map a function multiply by two across every individual item within the collection. So let is going to bind x to this value here. That's just the way of essentially think of it as assignment. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that because you can destructure and do all these crazy things. But um, for net, for our purposes right now, we'll just say. Why is it square bracket versus square This is a this so a let statement takes a vector and then within that vector you put the parameters. So in closure, these are this is a vector. This isn't an array. Um, that the difference. Wait, let's see. Persistent vector, yeah. Oh, I see. It's just duplication. Yes. Okay. Yep. So it's, it's syntax sugar for making one of those. Okay. It's syntax sugar for making, yes, a persistent vector. Yep. And so let takes a vector within that vector as arguments. Um, but you can do destructuring within a let statement. So if you've got a nested map or a list, um, so here we can, we'll get to the destructuring part in a little bit. but. Um, so just to make sure I call that point out, two, four, six, because we multiplied and then I returned back x, x didn't get changed, right? So, so that's kind of cool. And then, so here is um, map. So mapping, not map as in the data structure, but map as in mapping a function against a collection. Um, in this case, I'm actually mapping against a map. So, yeah, meta. Uh, let's. Oh wait, that's kind of small. So let's. Let me jack that up a little bit. All right. So I'll bring that up. And good in the back. Can you see that? Okay, great. Um, so I created a bunch of bad guys. Now I'm going to map this function where I'm going to take away their hearts of 20. And so I get, right, minus 20 is 80, 70. So it, do, it goes against the map. <coughs> a soch will change within that villains. So a soch takes, here, you know what? Here, let's do this. The docs always explain that better than me. So it'll take a collection and mul multiple key value pairs and update the map with those keys and values. So if you have an existing map, it goes through and based on the keys and the values you pass it, it will update within that map and give you a new map. Does that make sense? So here we go. Um, a soch, let's say A, we want to be one. Oh, sorry, we want the collection first. Uh, yes. Yep. Yeah, but I think it, yeah. Uh, and then we'll say A2, I think that's how that should work. So given the keys, it will replace, it can take as many arguments as you want. Because if this map was, um, here, let's do this. A1, and so this is where I would use a 
uh, comma to show that I'm um, key value pairs, uh, but you don't have to. P2, um, let's see, 3, and then I can say A, let's give it something complete. No, that will confuse me. There we go. And then close. So, as nested, if it, if it was nested, I could. I think you can do the nested part too. So it's really just. So it's like match that Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh huh. Um, and then if you had nested ones, you would use a ASOC. I say I call it ASOC. Well, ASOC in dash in, and then you could give it a vector and the keys to drill down to the section that you want to change, and then you provide the change there. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, you mean the uh, oh this one up here? Okay. So I'm taking the villain, which is the where oh it's being passed in. It's a map, and then I'm changing the hearts within that map. And what I'm doing is applying the function minus whatever that heart value is in 20. So that's how I get the. It only impacts the, the hearts within that map. But it doesn't change the map itself, because if I did baddies, there, it's, all, it's all there. So why do you need the sync around the outside? Why do I need the? the oh, this here? To evaluate it, it's forcing evaluation. Otherwise, you get a lazy. Oh. You get a lazy. It's lazy. Um, really? Yeah. So if I did, it might work on the REPL. It works here, yeah. but if you were evaluating yeah. code, it wouldn't, yeah. The print will force it a lot of times, but there are times where if it's nested, you won't get it. So seek forces the evaluation. Seek is a way to force evaluation. Um, so reduce, we've seen that. Filter, um, we could show that. These are all core functional programming constructs. Um, Yeah. Yep. Um, but I will do that here. Let's go to my scratch. That but that doesn't allow me to do any cool editing things. So I'll just um, s. So in order for that to work, I need to escape it or call list to create a list of numbers, because otherwise it will try to evaluate it as a form. Oh. Oh. So that's why you tend to, I, you, you, I tend to use vectors to, for examples. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's why you'll see, in my examples, you'll see a vector, but rather than the list. But you, more, more often than not, I, I'm using lists than I am vectors, but for, for display reasons, I don't, again, I don't want to type all that stuff, so I'm lazy. I guess I could have just done the tick mark, rather. <laughs> What's the question mark do? It, it's, uh, it's syntax quote, so it quotes the next data structure and doesn't allow, it prevents. It's a question mark. It indicates that. Oh, it's, um, it's true a, false. yeah, true, false. The, it's just a convention. Question mark is, you can put as part of your function name. And so any time I've used question mark, it's a, it evaluates to a Boolean. So odd would take in arguments and evaluate true or false. So based on this, it's filtering that list on which ones match odd, the odd predicate. And so that's why you see 13579. So is odd part of the language? Yes. Or did you find it somewhere? Nope, it's part of the core language. Um, if, if it's something that... Everything I'm going to show today is core language until I get to more of the framework stuff. Um, and if it's something I've developed, you'll see the actual source code for it. So anything that you're seeing today, I, I'm pretty confident, is core to the language. Uh, OK. So is there like a escape character for the function or variable's name, like in F sharp, tick, tick, and you can tag whatever symbols in your variable name, tick, tick, and um, no, I'm not familiar with F sharp. What would the, what would? Basically, like, you can say, like, uh, let tick tick and 
then type like a plus b tick tick and your variable is going to be a plus b. You, it's going to be the evaluation of a plus b? No, it's, it's a name. Oh, um, I'm sure there's probably, you, you probably could do that. Oh yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was misunderstanding what what the yeah. Yeah, we use the arrow, you know, dash, angle bracket in function names all the time versus transformer. So you know, sort. Speak of. So um, is this the arrow function that you were talking about? This arrow function, Jeff? No. Oh, right, okay, I understand now, yeah. Yep, I have. Um, so here's map, filter, reduce. Again, these are, I've went over them individually and here I put them together. Um, so one of the things that you will run into as you start, if you haven't, if you're starting into closure is this idea that it's kind of like, I think of it as that, the, the is it Russian dolls where you put the smaller one in the bigger one and you put the bigger one in the smaller and the big and you keep doing that. Well, you can run into that with closure because it, you, you, would pass, you start with this value and it gets passed into this value. So like, um, here, let's just do something here. So, uh, I think one, all right, so string, think one. It's just a trivial example here. So you see that it, it if you had enough chains, it'd get a little confusing as, what am I doing here? I have to go to ink and then I have to do the string and I have to do this other thing and it could get complex. Well, because... Um, it would look like Lisp. Yeah, it would. Um, but because you have the power of Lisp, you can actually rearrange the code flow or you can basically have the, bend the language to your will. One of the default, one of the out of the box things is this um, thread macro and this is the thread last macro. So it will take this list and pass it as the last argument in the next function, evaluate, pass that as the last item in the next function, pass that to the next function. So uh, it's a little more declarative to read. So you, I, I like to think of it as this is where I make my recipes, like, okay, got this list, I'm gonna, I'm gonna increase it, map that, I wanna filter it, I wanna reduce, and you read from top to bottom. Um, I like to use this quite a bit. There's an, a thread first macro, we'll talk about that. Um, but as you can, and then I have the value, as it's evaluated, kind of what's, what's happening intermediate, in, in the intermediate steps. So if things are getting passed at the end of each one of these, so this two, three, five, six, four, five, six gets passed here at the end, and then this value will get passed at the end of the, at, with, at the end of this function here. Oh, so question, yes. Yes, you can use reduce. Reduce will actually take more than two, two arguments. It's similar to map where I showed three. If there's an equal number, not equal, but it will go through up to the point where all of the sequences that, so if you have two, if you have like a jagged array between, I think it will stop at the shortest one. <coughs> okay, all right. Um, this is just another continuation of that map reduce. Um, Filtering multiples three and five. Again, there's the question mark. Um, just to show the predicate to an help answer the question earlier is what's odd do? Um, it, could, it takes the candidate here and then I apply this vector and I map the um, the remainder. That's, that's um, part of the function definition. So this is where the arguments go to the function. So this is function, this will define a function, this is a function name, and then anything that's passed to that function would be within the vector. So typically in a Lisp, it would be another list. So this is where closure uh, departs from that and helps, it, helps you visually see, oh, okay, I, I, I'm, normally when I'm working with vectors, I've, it's typically arguments. I'm like, oh, okay, visually I, I'm thinking, oh yeah, because I'm, I'm never really constructing them, except for like in this case, I put three and five, but again, I would just put list of three and five, if that's truly what I wanted. Okay. All right. 
uh, comprehension. So I didn't want to write up the for comprehension. For is not just a loop, it's, it's a full on comprehension on steroids. You can do all of the, similar to Scala, um, you can put in predicates within the for loop to do your filtering and so it does, it does everything that the other collections do, um, but it's more general. So I put a list in, a link in here to, it, it gets pretty crazy. And for an intro talk, I just wanted to point to it. And if people were interested in checking out all of the things you can do with for, I've used it for uh, Cartesian, Cartesian products. Um, I've used it quite a bit for that actually when I was first learning it just because I thought it was kind of this neat thing of seeing how you could bind two ranges and then iterate over them. So when, when is the predicate that like, you can put in to like do filtering? So it's got a number of things while, um, it's got a number of things that it can do. So how many wins you can have in your for loop? I don't know. I don't, never, I don't really reach for the for loop that often because map, reduce, filter, they, they pretty much take care of all of the things that I, I run into. So it's basically like pattern matching? Or no, it's not. Pattern matching isn't, um, you can get a, a closure library called core logic to do pattern matching type stuff, um, but this not, it's not really pattern matching. Multi-methods. Multi-methods, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, so, and if I'm taking multiple arguments, I usually put the, like the and, ampersand rest, and then I bundle all of the arity, and then I apply a reduce function on it or a filter, whatever I'm doing with it, I, I apply collection on that, rather than having to define the, does it take one parameter, does it take two? I typically don't go to that level, I just do the x and rest. So if there is some rest to that, then I'll just um, think of it as uh, the dot, dot, dot in Java. Kind of a thing. And yeah, destructuring is pretty close to pattern matching. Uh, it's really close. It's not Erlang's pattern matching, but um, it's still pretty powerful. Recursion. This was just oh, so the important parts here is when you're doing recursion, um, the let statement. So if you have a, you know, I've got this function name here. I'm sorry. I'm defining a function sum of digits. It's taking this value x. This is what would we returned in the doc statement. So this string, I think that's right. Yeah, this string would return back in the doc statement. Instead of using a let, I use a loop. And, and what that will do is recur will apply, will pass these back up to the loop and rebind them. Uh, you could just re recur back up to sum of digits, but a lot of times you'll find that you'll do something with that value after the top level. Um, that you and you wouldn't that you can loop here. So I could take this out and loop it to sum of digits for this example. Um, and actually, I don't think I could apply a default value there. No, that's not true. I just was doing this to show loop. That's why. Steven looked like you had a question. What's that? Oh, okay, okay. So re recur, if you're doing recursive statements, recur has to be the last statement with, has to be at the tail, right? The tail end. If this value, evaluate this, else okay, so recurs this. Here, let's do, here. Let's do this, because this, this didn't get translated very well. No, after the x, sorry, after this x here, I am binding there. It's like a let statement. It's doing a local binding of x1 to the string of the absolute value of x. So the loop is not like a function definition? Loop is doing a local binding, like let would do. It's just an indicator for recur to, yeah, uh-huh. Or else if loop's not there, it would, 
you would do recur up to here. So every time you recurs back to x1, it's here time? Correct. Uh, let's see here. So, yep, uh, apply there. Now, so does recur, when you call recur, is it like passing thousands? Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 these are arguments here. That's kind of why I expected Luke to define what those arguments were. Like, I thought x1 would be like recur pass. So if you think of um, it's passing the values of this back into x1. Does that make sense? Well, but I thought x1 was being set to the value of stir mass. The first time. That's the default. That's <laughs> It comes from the subsequent calls. Okay. So you don't have to explicitly call the sum of digits function again. That's what the recursion Yes, is. correct. So let, here, let's run it. Um, oh, I'm in closure script. That's not going to work. Uh, you know what? Let's try the. Let's see if the um, if this will work with this. Probably won't, but yeah, it won't take the ABS in there. All right, we'll just move. I'll do some magic hand waving, and we'll move on. Can you just take the ABS off because you can pass in a positive number and not care about it? Oh sure. You know what? Let's just let's just be le the stir of let's just be legit here. Yeah, we're gonna. Again, uh, I think that should work. Yeah, I know. I switched shells, and I typically don't even look at this. I'm usually in my Emacs uh, environment. So I'll take a second to warm up, and then we'll come back. You know what? I don't want to move on until we. Okay. Uh, sum of digits. Okay, so let's do two, three, four. Digits, two, three, four. Cool. This, uh, sorry, th when, when you see an indentation like that, that's plus sign is acting on both the uh, accumulator and the next thing below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, so you're, okay, so you're, so you're calling it with two then, right? Yeah, right, because I'm binding the accumulator here. Okay. I'm being a little tricky. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I guess I got it. Sure. So, um, yep, the accumulator. Um, Typically, if I'm writing code, you, I'll, I'll just bind two at a time. I try not to do more than that because it just doesn't look to me. I, I just get lost in some of that code if I have multiple bindings on the same line. So with the maps and when I'm doing stuff like this, it's easier to see that I've got two, two things I'm binding. Um, you can add commas. Add commas? <laughs> Higher order functions. Um, there's the juxtaposition, partial, which uh, is easy to confuse um, with curry, but it's not quite that. But you can think of it, for intensive purposes, you can think of it as a curry. Um, apply, comp, and anonymous functions, which we sh I showed earlier, the anonymous function. Um, juxt takes a set of functions and returns a function that is the juxtaposition of those functions. Like, what? What does that mean? Um, so even as I was reading, I was like, oh, I'm going to definitely show an example of this. And so here, I'm going to I'm going to take three items. I'm going to take this anonymous function. Oh, sorry, it's hard to read here. This anonymous function here, um, and to define an anonymous function, it's the pound sign before um, a paren, and then you pass, then you, then the function itself, and percent sign equates to you can do you can do percent one. Or percent, it, it means one. But if you have multi, -er you want to do a multi-arity anonym, anonymous function. There's two ways you can do it. You can do it with fn defining it, or you can do it with just this this shorter syntax. Is 
Um, and you could say percent side one, percent side two, percent side three. I think it maxes out at like 32. I don't know why you would do 32, but um, that's kind of the upper, somewhere around there is the upper limit. So I'm taking the juxtaposition of these three functions and I'm going to apply it to this uh, persistent vector. And what it returns back is a collection of those three applied on each individual one. So is it even? No. Is it odd? Yes. And then give me the identity of that just to show that it, how it works. Um, so you could use something like this if you were like trying to group things within a collection, you wanted to do some filtering or something. Um, I, hardly, I, have, I've had, I haven't had the need to use this very often, but uh, except for like an advent of code, I think I might have used it somewhere in there, just one of those algorithm problems where you're trying to do some code golf. Um, it, just know it's there, higher order function, you're passing functions to a function that creates another function. So this juxt right here actually created a function in itself and then map applied what that was to the list. I'm war am I warping some minds here? Okay. Yes? Did you say you're mapping the vector onto the function or the other way around? I'm mapping, I think of it as mapping the function onto the vector. Um, but I think if you wanted to say you were mapping the vector onto the function, I'd be okay with that. So normally what you would do is, not normally, but what, what you'd most likely see if, you, if it wasn't a defined function that you're passing, you do like a fn and then you you define an anonymous function or you would use the pound sign, I'm sorry, the pound hashtag sign and then the function. But you can see that you don't have to do that with jux because it's actually returning back a function. So that's kind of, I think I lost some people when I went through the words that were kind of jumbled in my brain here. Uh, okay, partial. Takes a function f and fewer than normal arguments to f and returns a function that takes a variable number of arguments. So in this case, I define 10xer, it takes a name and productivity level, and then it's just gonna print out the name and then multiply that productivity by 10. And then um, I partially apply that with doing one argument. There we go. Let's see, did I move something up there? Okay, so 10xer. And then I bind it to a var, so I've got one, but now I can call, get it fully evaluated here by passing it a value, and then so it, then it would evaluate it. So again, similar to what I've used curry in the past for. Um, Jeff, do you remember the distinction between partial and curry? Well, it's just the, the time it's evaluated, is that correct? Or curry can do, one at a time? Okay. So pass goes forward curry because no function takes more than one. One argument, that's right. But is not a curry language. Thank you, sir. Uh, apply. Apply a function f to the argument list formed by prepending intervening arguments to the args. Like, again, like what? That's tough to digest. But you'll see this when you want to apply to a collection of collections, apply will come in, hand, come in handy. A lot of times you, you can use apply and reduce and they'll get the same results. But there's, if you read into it, um, there's some performance differences on how they get applied. Not anything that you would notice unless you were really working with crazy stuff. So I'm going to map string to these collections. And it gives me a new collection of all of those things concatenated together. Yes. No. Oh, I thought you had a hand up. Okay. All right. Calling map and then applying the string. It would it would apply. A str Let's do it. Strings a function, and I can apply it to this. Right. Because it's applying it to the individual items within the thing. Yeah. Like produce 
when you have multiple collections in the argument list, it, it puts them together because the smallest factor is good. It will pull from each, if there's an, if I had three of these separated, you're sa Jeff, you're saying if I took that, if I took this off and applied it this way, you would get one, four, seven? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Right? It's multi-arity as well. So that goes back to that FizzBuzz kind of way that I was pulling from multiple things. Fancy, yes. What's that joke um, from the elegant? Uh, anyone know the Lisp joke from XKECD? Oh, you mean the one that adds the future to your problems? Yes. <laughs> it's a reference to the Star Wars thing. I meant to grab that. Um, an elegant we weapon for a more civilized age or something uh, in, re in reference to Lisp. <laughs> good? Everyone good with that? OK. Um, do I need to take a quick break to talk about some things that I've covered that are still unclear? Okay. Um, so comp. Comp returns a set of functions that is the composition of those functions. So in this case, I'm taking, I'm calling num length, and I'm going to feed it string, sorry, comp, the count and the string function, and it will count, it will apply the string first, it works right to left, and then it will count it. So take one, two, three, four, five, turn it into a string, and then count how many items are within that string. Um, again, you, you can get really sophisticated with that as you're doing higher order functions, but core to the language, um, craziness, right? Um, anonymous function, these are just a few ways I was, I talked about them earlier, but Here's just a way to show that you can create um, this anonymous function. It takes one argument, essentially is multiplying it by itself because it's the same. You know, this represents like um, one, one. It basically is the same thing as this down here. Sorry, the one and the one. This would take two separate arguments. Um, but if you get too crazy, I, I think it's more readable to do the the f define a, a anonymous function using fn just so that it, it's easier to kind of visually see as you're, if it's, if it's a long anonymous function, then I think that you, having the, the pound sign and, and the shorter version gets kind of hard to read at points. Um, the reader produces data structures from text. So you get the power of, the, of what Clojure's doing at your fingertips. So we could read this, we could read this string and create the data structure. So this is where that code becomes data kind of thing fits into play. Um, it's, it's more powerful than eval, uh, if you've used eval. Um, so here, I've created the data structure that gets printed out there, right? It doesn't evaluate it, though, because it's just reading it and creating the data structure. Um, in this case, it's just printing it out again. Uh, and then read strings. I needed to have a note in here to add eval, but I didn't. So what I'm showing here is I've converted this into the string here, and then I just read it back, just to show that you can go back and forth with that particular concept. So I got it back to my original list of JVM languages. Frege is a Haskell for JVM, if you've not been around that. I've only looked at it cursory because Haskell still blows my mind after chapter seven of learn you some Haskell for great good. Brain melts a little bit, so. Um, macros, um, talk a little bit about that. So if we, we showed the, I showed the thread macro earlier and it allows you to basically, macros allow you to conform closure in ways that you couldn't do with other languages. Uh, and one, one of the first rules of macro club is don't create a macro, um, unless it can't be done in a function. Um, so when, you, when you're, and I haven't written many macros, I've had 
some opportunities I thought were there, but it turned out the function was way better than doing the macro. Um, but in this case, unless is not part of the closure language, but you can make it a first class part of the language by creating this macro. And so a lot of times you'll see macro for control flows. Uh, in this case, we're going to add this new control flow called unless to the language. Um, and we can say, I can evaluate this here just to show that it works. I hope it works, right? Unless one, do true, unless false, so, right? But um, the, the cool thing is, is if, if you're creating macros, Clojure actually will give you some tools to expand what it actually translates the code to. And so in this case, it, it takes, it basically will show what I define that macro at, and you can do that with anything within the language. Say, hey, I want to know how this works. There's a couple of tools. Uh, if it's pretty, if it's pretty wieldly, there is some tree walker type things if you're really kind of wanting to get down into that level. Um, it's a whole new world when you're looking at macros and developing macros. I want to just cover it as an intro. Um, thread first macro, we talked about that earlier. And um, I won't spend too much more time on this. This was a SoundX helper class that when I wrote sound, a SoundX. Um, I did that in college in C, and I, I find myself rewriting things in college just to remember how much um, I've improved. Because <laughs> I remembered like lots of code and then coming back going, oh wow, I've learned a lot, and well, how would I do that now? And it gives me something trivial to put together. So um, one of the things I'll point out is uh, for a lot of, you may not see this a lot of times, I won't do this a whole lot, but it's for when I'm showing people for the first time how this works, since these are, these commas are um, syntax, white space essentially, I'm showing where it's patching it in in this case. So commas are white space. It does, the compiler doesn't care about it, closure doesn't care about them, you just do it because it makes you feel good. So in this case, I'm applying, um, or if you're doing a map, then you could separate the key value pairs. I'm going to apply a string to this conversion map, which is a f function defined outside of this. And then I'm going to pass it as the first argument to the next function. I kind of explained that previously. But I put these in to sh visually show where I'm pat patching it into the next function, just so that it's more clear rather than me saying, and then visually not there's some dis dissonance there. So it'll. Is that because this is thread first? Yes, this is thread first. Oh, okay. Yep. So if it was thread last, I would put these at the end, which I should have done in the, the prior example just to help convey that, the concept. Um, this right here represents a regular expression within um, closure, which is pound sign, quote, and then um, the, your regular expression. The, so yeah, patching in the first, and then this gets patched into here, and this gets patched into here. So that's all I really want. Yes? OK. OK. No, that's okay. Um, thread last, we did that earlier, and this is the same example, but this I actually put the patches in to help people see where I was threading that next arg the next function into the, the results into the next function. Okay. Destructuring. <clears throat> this is where I have a lot of fun. I think this destruction is when I came, JavaScript's doing it now. I've seen that. Um, it's not quite there that you can do it and I've not seen it yet as it matches closures destructuring, but it's cool. Um, list first map, very attic. So destructuring a vector in a list. Define the list here. So let's, let's just run this because I think it'll make more sense if I, okay, person name. And then I'm gonna use this let function to destructure in the binding this person name, which is these you know, Juan and Vasquez, and I'm going to pull out the two pieces within that structure. Tracking? Okay. And then we'll print out those two pieces individually. All right? Juan, Vasquez, and then nil gets printed out because it's evaluated. And Can you use structure in the function definition? Yes. Yep. And I'll show some examples when we look at, um, yep, absolutely. Maps, vectors, lists. Um, I comment this one out just because uh, both having them both in the name, same namespace just would have canceled it out. But this is a vector, this is a list, the same. It would do the same thing. It would pull out two from whatever was the collection. And, 
All right. Destructuring a map. So we did this. I did the same thing here. Um, and the way that you can destructure, there's a there's a whole page full of great stuff on destructuring. You could actually, I could actually put in this case here, I could put f name and then put first name as it written here, not as a key function, and then last name and then l name, and it would populate that way. But typically, what you'll see is you'll say, hey, I just I know these are the key names. You're passing in a map. I know these are the keys that, that I want out of that map. So then I will. I will put keys here, followed by this vector, and the keys and the values that I want out of that key. It won't give me the key name, it'll give me the value. So it'll give me Juan and Vasquez rather than F name and last name. But it's still bound to, um, I could still bind it to a person. I, crazy, right? Okay, we'll, we'll show an example. So I'll go ahead and do the one that I have written here, just again to show that I'm pulling the keys out. Right, pulled the keys out of pulled out f first name, which is this value, and pulled out last name, which is this value from person, which I defined up here, and then I'm printing that stuff out, right? But if I wanted to also um, print out the person, sorry, I'm going to be jumping back and forth between my scratch space here to uh, okay as um, combo. And then we'll go ahead and takes. I want that. I'll print line the combo. Boom, I get the whole map back. So essentially you can think of this as aliasing the whole the whole thing. So you can refer to it if you need to. And I actually had to when I show the project that I worked on earlier, I'll show a case where I, I, I do both. I pull out certain values that I need, but I also need the full structure to pass on to the next, the next function. And if the person had a middle name key, combo would not? No. Uh, that's a good question. Let's, uh, let's see. Where was that? So. Let's just do M name. Um, you're getting to learn a lot about me today. Okay. It's okay. Equifax was hacked, so, you know, like, hey, whatevs. Okay, uh, so we'll do that, and then we'll rerun the let statement here. And then let's see what combo gives us. Is it a yep, it gives us the whole thing. Okay. Sorry, what? Java? Yeah. Unless you believe in destiny. <laughs> or what? Curse? <laughs> Sorry, did someone have a question? Jeff? Since you've got person defined in a real REPL, you can try the colon F name function on it. Oh, thank you. Yep. Uh, person. Thank you. So you can. Yeah, it did. It, it grabbed the whole enchilada. Um, someone thought it wouldn't, but I was pretty sure that it was going to do that because I've been using it for this program that I'm going to show here in a minute. So here it is, function as a key. I'm sorry, keyword as a function on person. But the thing is, is if it doesn't exist, right, let's just add names. You get nil back, right? Um, but there's another way to access data within a map, and you can do it this way, F name. And this, this is helpful if you're trying to make some things more readable, and you'll know, like you'll know as you get into things like, oh, people won't understand that I'm passing in a, a map, because, or a keyword, because maybe you pass that into a function and it kind of loses its way within your code, so then you would say, get, get on the collection this key, gets it right. But the difference is, is when it fails, um, oh no, it's the same. Okay. Sorry. Oh, here, like this. Okay. Oh, right. It is a default. Yeah. Yep. So because. Person. 
person colon ethnic. Oh, right, yeah. Thank you. F name, yeah. Yep. Good. We're, I know it's getting kind of long. I don't, there's not very many, so there's a couple of slides left, and then I'll show some um, other things here. Handle variadic functions. Someone was asking about variadic functions earlier. This is a way to do that, and how I've done that is, I, again, I put this ampersand in group, and it pulls everything together. So I've defined myself and two of my four boys. Um, def record is a way to enforce some structure around a map. You can think of it as a structure around a map. It's a little bit different than that, but just for our purposes, we'll say that. Um, so we'll, here, I'll put this function in and we'll, rever we'll revisit it. Um, did I miss a parenthesis? Too many arguments to do. this. What's going on here? All right, well, I must have messed that one up. Is that your band name? No, that's a, that's a built-in. Um, that's how you define a record with enclosure. Um, yeah, that puzzles me why it's not pulling that stuff out. So I'll walk through it, though. this here to evaluate? No, it's the fact, so when, when you, watch, if I do this here, you'll see that closure will give me, right, it's, def, it's actually defined it, but there, I'm having, I must have mistyped in. Oh, this is missing one here, yep, okay, thank you. All right, so thank you. If I was in Emacs, it would have barked at me. So let's do this. Um, after Jackson, okay, everything's good, good. Okay, so let's try that now. All right, so there's the band. And then we want to just throw these. So, Jaden's band consists of the following instruments, drums, ukulele, gu guitar. So if we look back at that function uh, here, you'll see what, what I did was I took the first musician, and I'm considering a person a musician here, and then the rest. It could have been 15, it could have been two. A uh, group would just hold the collection of that. And then I'm, I'm gonna bind this var here, group instrument, and what it is gonna be the evaluation of this function of interposing comma, which we see here, oops, which we see here, comma, and then comma, I think there. And I'm mapping the keyword instrument on the group. So group comes in, it's a collection of people, and they all have an instrument. The third thing is an instrument, drums, electric guitar, ukulele, so I can map this keyword against that group and get all that out, and that's what I wanted. So then all I needed to do was, just, was then just concatenate using print line and take the first name of that first musician that I passed in, put in some text, and then I just grabbed all the instruments from, from, the mus from that musician, the first guy that comes in, and then I attached the group instruments afterwards. So. Yeah, because I'm creating the, this is one of the ways to do it. Uh-huh. Well, all of it's Java under the hood. So in this case, it's the box. Yeah, yep. Um, so the, there's a few ways if you're using records, you can instantiate um, that record to enforce those rules. This is the one that I chose to show today. Yeah, yeah. Constructor. thank you, constructor. Um, so isomorphic web app. You know, there, were, there was a lot of talk about Node being able to write JavaScript on the back end and the server, server, sorry, server side and front end. You can do the same with Clojure. Um, you can write Clojure on the back end and Clojure script on the front end. Most of it, um, there's a few cases where you'll run into if you're using some core Java libraries that won't 
like ABS was one that we saw earlier since I was in the closure ripple. Um, if you're using line again, th these commands will, will, will get a starter project up and then so, you know, I had the streaming demo app that I was trying to put together. And I just will show, just open a new REPL here. On my extremely long bash prompt. <laughs> uh, so let's go to my code directory. So I'll create a new closure project using Luminous, which is, could not because, oh, it already exists. So let's call it, let's call it something else. Streaming Oja demo. All right. So line again will generate it, it's done. I'll just go into the streaming Oja demo and then run it. Um, I also run it and then And then I'll run this thing called Fig Wheel. So the closure folks have made a, a really good case for, or made it really enjoyable to write closure on the front end. So it does hot, this hot, the hot module reloading um, using Fig Wheel. Fig Wheel is the, the engine that will run and keep evaluating the closure script part of your code. Um, you see me running two REPLs here because I also am running the closure um, instance, I mean, running closure to run the server side. Um, so we'll go to localhost 3000. Localhost 3000. And so here's the OJUG demo. You get this right out the gates. Um, I think Figwill is probably still turning away. Oh, I've got a Figwill instance running early. Yeah, because I was running it here. So let's do it. Uh, yep, again, I would be editing code uh, in my. Emacs editor, but I didn't want to make this about the editor today. So it'll run, and then this this will change into the um, closure code that's on the on the um, browser side. It'll actually it'll actually attach to the the ID tag app, I think, and then um, take over the page at that point. So this is just a warning saying, hey, you should run FigWheel and actually get your closure sip stuff that you asked for when you created this. Um, okay, so now it says FigWheel is running. And in this case, we should see, there we go. So now the closure script side code on the front end's running, and it's just giving you helpful things about how that project's laid out and what to do with it. But as you've got FigWheel open, you would interface with JavaScript you can interface it through the um, command line and you can say alert, like hello, hi, you know. Um, right, so you actually can interact with the browser within FigWheel if that's what you wanted to do. And Jeff has it hooked into his Emacs session where he's running it from his editor and interactively messing with the page. Um, I haven't gotten that far yet. So I'll kill that. Um, Chimera is if you wanted to try out Closure Script, and just to see the difference, you have Try Closure for the Closure stuff, and Try um, Chimera for Closure Script code. If you wanted to play around with the Closure Script stuff, and it's got a nice little cheat sheet below it, uh, I'll go ahead and kill that, and I will kill that because I don't want to get confused here when we go to the the last part of the talk here. So, um, all right. I'll talk a little bit about Closure Spec in the, the, the example here that's going to follow. Um, it's something that was introduced to Closure, and it's a way to, well, it, specs provide a composition of predicates. It's a way for you to do s validation on steroids, I'd say. It, get, it can generate tests for you based on the spec that you've created, and it can do, um, serve as um, a validation check, and I'll show some examples. It took me a while to get my head around it. I'm still kind of learning how that works. It's, but um, it's very interesting in that it uses test check. Uh, it's based on test check um, within Clojure. And it, when it generates tests for you, if it finds a failing generation of that test, it'll enumerate a bunch of things. It is smart enough to pick 
the, the smallest test case for failure. And then it gives you a bunch of information around that so that you can replay that test if you need to at a later time. Um, to, to re, like the seed, it gives you the seed that it created in order to generate those tests. Um, very, very interesting stuff. Um, okay, so we won't get to the advanced topics. Well, I just will mention them. Closure, as closure async is for the browser. Well, it's not just for the browser, but um, it uses Go channels. So anyone that's heard about um, Go and the awesomeness that Go channels provide, closure, you can do that in Clojure. Um, again, it's through macros, the fact that you can meld the language into a form that you want. It was pretty, it was pretty um, in interesting to watch how, um, when Go came out, how fast async came out, and then core logic is uh, mini Conron, is that how you say it? Um, so it's pattern matching, logic based. I think of Prolog when I, Mini Canon, thank you. Um, I think of Prologue and the stuff I did with Prologue when I look at CoreLogic stuff. Uh, so with that, um, one of the things I'll show you is, um, so one of the things I did with Clojure, and Matt Steele's not here because he did this in JavaScript, uh, created an Arnold C interpreter. All right, if you've, is everyone familiar with Arnold C? Yeah, no. So Arnold C is a programming language based off of Arnold Schwarzenegger's um, quotes. So it's Showtime, talk to the hand, you have been terminated. So every program begins with Showtime, um, talk to the hand, terminate. And so it has this whole thing, false means I lied, true is no problemo. Um, you know, there's some curse words, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, there's one of my favorites is I need your I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. Um, get to the chopper, and then um, yeah, enough talk. So I took this. I thought it'd be cool to create an interpreter, and I sat on it for a while. And then Matt Steele did it, and I trade we traded notes. Um, he was saying, "Hey, I'm trying to do this," and I was like, "Oh, here's the stuff." I I pointed to Coursera on their um, language course that they had, and we went through. Um, some of that, and we went back and forth, and he he got it out. Um, so, Matt, when you watch this, thanks for the inspiration, because um, he did. It. I was like, oh, I really need to get off my butt and, and get this done. So I took this, um, and I had worked with Closure on Advent of Code, and there was a there was a wiring problem, and um, in that it said, hey, you're going to read in these wires, and you're going to have to hook up the electricity in a certain way, and there's this. Closure library called Instaparse, which will you you can create a grammar, and it will generate out the the tokens for you. So I'll, I'll, I'll get there. Right, it's computer science type stuff that I really enjoyed when I was in school. Um, so I'm going to show how easy it was for me to create an Arnold C programming language. So I've got a lexer and I've got the interpreter, and then just for fun, I was showing that all I had to do to change the the words within the language um, was just change the grammar in a way. So a pig Latin larks, the pig Latin lexer. So I can also do Arnold with it as pig Latin. So all those quotes can be pig Latinized. Uh, so this code's all up on GitHub, and there you could, if you have line again, you could run it and have fun with it. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the interpreter. Well, I won't talk to that first. I'll talk to the lexer. So um, I defined the tokens of the language based on what you saw that list, and I made it a map. Um, and then I defined my grammar, and it's a string, and it, a grammar, you know, you have your things on the left and then the sentence on the right. So I have defined what the Arnold C language is within this string. You know, here's assignment, here's printing, and then on the left side, it eventually gets down to one of those token values. So true is, um, one on tokens, and so what is one up here? Um, right here it is no problemo. So I'm, I'm essentially just putting those values into the string because I knew at a later point I was going to want to transform those strings into Pig Latin or uh, Ermagerd or just to show that you know how easy it would be to change all that stuff. So um, here is here is the Arnold C interp language as a string enclosure, and then all I need to do is just parse that. Here and that defines Arnold C, and then I added some features here with 
and I'll point to the Stack Overflow that helped me as I was trying to write a debugger for exception handling. Um, so when it, when it breaks, it does the right thing and says the things that you're supposed to say. So um, lights, camera, action, that's how I wanted to start it. Um, that's the function I defined. I run the parser that's part of InstaParser on that Arnold C grammar. And I take all the expressions here, and then I just run through it and break it all up. All right, so code is data, data is code. And then in order, in order to um, interpret all that, I use multi-methods. So um, and to hold the state, I create a symbol table to hold all of the state of my um, app. And then um, here, I define this as run, multi-method run. And it's going to take the first element out of the, it's going to define where it goes based on the first item within a list or a vector, and it then will match it against the multi-method. So if it comes back as program, because when the parser does its thing, it's going to put it into these kind of these keywords. It looked like a, a vector with a keyword in front of it. So program starts it all off, and then you can see I've got begin main, and then statement. Um, because I define the multi-method as run here, um, you're seeing that in order, it's essentially matching on the on that first token, I said, hey, match on that. So statement, run, choose, op. There's just a whole bunch of, of things here, but this essentially interprets the whole language. Um, again, it was more complicated thinking about how to um, do the multi-method stuff than it was actually to create the tokens to be interpreted. Um, and Arnold C wasn't as well documented as you would have thought. Right, so there was corner cases I was running into, and I was like, wait. So I, I, I think I made a couple design uh, choices on it, but um, it got really interesting, and it made me, a pre I got to understand how JavaScript was written in a weekend, and where some of the hoisting came into play, because I was, I was doing this myself. I was like, oh, this is much easier if I do it like this. And I was like, yeah, that's why we have things that were happening you know, as JavaScript in the early days, and still kind of dealing with. But, I, read, I had much more appreciation for language creation, so um, I, I appreciate more of what happened when JavaScript was created than I would have before. Um, so now to show the last thing, which we're getting kind of late here, so um, I'll make it quick. So um, one of the things I did was, oops. I needed, again, I needed a um, hobby thing to show that was non-trivial, but still trivial enough. Um, so I created, the, is everyone familiar with the Enigma machine from World War II, the encryption machine? So that was an assignment that we did in college in C, and I remember I wrote, I must have been 10, 20 times the code I ended up writing this time around. Again. I'm in a different place, but it was just was a fun thing I always wanted to go back to because I was always kind of disappointed. Like, man, I really I got the assignment done, but I wasn't really happy with it, and so I'm like, I got to go back to it. And so I did, um, and then I, I put it up on my repository, just the closure version of it, and we can just kind of look quickly at, um, you know, I, I did the three rotors, um, option of three reflectors, and stepping, stepping each rotor, that sort of thing. So I put that all together. Um, the details aren't how it works isn't really what I want to talk about. I just wanted to show that there's some stuff out there for that in order to do this. In, in doing this talk, I put this together, and then I actually webinized it, um, webitized it, I guess. And I took, so here's, a, here's instances where I'm using the, the destructuring with keys and then at, adding pass through um, because I wasn't sure if I was going to need it later. But uh, it turns out when I look at the code, I didn't, so I can probably take that out. Um, but I did, there's por parts in here where I'm pulling back the whole machine and then passing the machine onwards. But we'll, that, that code's small, so we'll, we'll go to the, the real stuff here. X0. Um, all right. This is all. This right here is validation code um, using uh, closure spec, so I can def 
define all of the rules that make a proper Enigma machine. Um, so when I post this code, um, you can peruse that as, as you wish to see some, of the, some examples there. So here, I, I, the machine takes three rotors, um, and then I've got the rotors, and I, I pass back the rotors where, nope, not there. Let's do this. I'm looking for the one that had the machine on it. Oh right, okay. So here's here's the full the full configuration of the machine. It takes a left rotor, a middle rotor, right rotor, reflector setting, and plug board. And since it's keys, it doesn't matter the order, right? It's just looking for the keys and binding them to those very to those bars. And then I'm aliasing essentially the whole machine. I'm calling it e machine. And then I'm using the e machine itself, but I'm also using the rotors individually as I'm working through the code. Um, this this is. This isn't what I would put in production. This was me throwing it together um, at last minute at 1 a.m. to get some concepts shown. Um, so this would be a lot cleaner. But again, you can write messy code in any language. Um, so with that said, we can go here and see. I think there we go. So we've got an Enigma machine. And I'll leave it in the AAA configuration. And I'll type away, and here I've got a bunch of things running saying, hey, the rotors have stepped as I was debugging. Um, all right, I can write messages. So if anyone was following me last night, they were seeing me write messages on Twitter to folks using Enigma. And so, um, you know, we could, let's see, I think, here we go, you cannot hide from me. I, I think Matt was up late last night. I, I was, I didn't, so I wrote him back. And uh, he says, you can't hide from me. I think what was happening is he probably saw me tweeting and then deleting them right away because they just were just nonsensical. People were just like, what are you doing? Um, what also is funny is I've had different, this is translate from Indonesian. <laughs> I had translate from German yesterday. Um, so I think Twitter's AI is gonna be going crazy on what I'm doing. But um, since I put AAA in as my source, I can put it back in and then translate it back. So in this case, it's, you know, catch me if you can, because he said, I can't hide from him. Um, but he didn't know I was working on this. So at some point, he'll see this. And he'll, if I, when I get this up on Heroku, just for fun, he'll want to run that through. Um, but so one of the things that I showed with the course spec is that you can use that for error checking. And you can see that right here that I, I'm posting it, I'm just putting it in a div tag as it is interactively I'm using reframe, um, talk for another time, but it allows me to do, it's, it's kind of a, it's the framework using React under the hood that um, you can use in order to write a web app. And I can show just a little bit of code here on, let's see, core CLJS. So when I define the div tags, I'm using vectors and something called Hiccup. You could use more HTML. Uh, Selmer, I think, is one of the libraries you can use. Um, but again, code is data, data is code. And so when, if I define my HTML as a form, in this form for Hiccup, um, all I have to do is call um, re reagents um, render, and it wraps it in React and pushes out the component for me. So if you follow any talks, I think Dave Nolan talks, David Nolan talks about the fact, or his blog post, you can see that in some cases, Clojure outperforms React because of the immutability built into the language, so it doesn't have some of the overhead. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something that's pretty cool. Um, and then, let's see here. One last thing, we'll do, we'll do this. Oh, catch me if you can. Um, let's see, I'll see if my Twitter's still available. Hello from OJUG. So, yep, it's not gonna work because, let's do this. Let's see if I reset my token, if it's gonna, okay. Sign in, give me the authorization. It's gonna re-render, hold it, holding that info, and then say hello from OJUG, and let's see if it lets me post, yep. And so I can see that 
ending with SDH. We'll go back to Twitter and let's see here. So there it is right there. So um, at some point, well, not some point, but if I wanted to, you know, it translates back hello from OJ. And <laughs> it's, it's separated, I partitioned it in five. Um, one of the things that, you know, if you're encoding things, you don't want the, because it's three characters, right? So it's being partitioned into five here. Um, that's why it's reading kind of funny there. Um, so what I was going to do is publish this here once I finish some cleaning up that code. And um, this is only going to allow 147 characters, because I think it's 150 for Twitter. Is that right? Or 160? I don't know. Um, I looked it up the other day, but it's not something that I kept in the back of my mind. But one of the things I think I I'm going to put in is what the rotor positions and reflectors are at the bottom so that you can go back and decode it rather than, or you could have fun and say, hey, Juan, what's the code for today? And um, you could do that. Uh, so that's all I have. Any other questions? Was it a lot to take in? Yeah. So the cool presentation and everything, I'm not, but the, the, the question is, so what, right? I mean. Yeah. Uh, what's more valuable about this than another language? Or oh, sure. What, you know? Yeah. So um, one, I think one, it forces you to think out of the confines of, of, a, of maybe the language of choice you're using today. Maybe you're using multiple languages. Um, you, you're seeing Java incorporate a lot of functional programming concepts today. Um, now, this is, so my, my bias is that I've been looking at Clojure since before, like 2012. So I've been looking at it for a while, but I've, I noticed when there was going to be anti-patterns in the streaming APIs, when developers were going to introduce those, and I was like, no, that's not really how you want to do that. So having functions be first-class citizens up front changes how you're looking at as languages adopted into their paradigm, how you're looking at the language and how to develop with like Java and Groovy. Um, so when I was doing this, this massively improved the way I, I wrote my Groovy code because there were some things in there that I didn't think about. Unique was one of the things in Groovy early on that mut mutated a data structure. And I didn't think, oh, big deal, right? I don't care. But then it turns out I did care. I, I was like, oh, wait, if somebody does a unique because they think that they're doing it and they pass it back or some code does that. So there's things to learn, even if you don't write in this code every day, which I don't. I write in the code every night, but I don't do it as a, as a day job. Um, the other benefit, too, is if you haven't really warmed up to JavaScript, um, and I'm one of those folks that are like, well, I don't really want to learn all of the equal, equal, equal versus equal, equal and the truthiness, you can use Clojure's truthiness, and it compiles down um, to some pretty, it uses the Google Closure. This is a, this is an unfortunate naming conflict, but it uses Google Closure with an S um, compiler, and it runs all of all of this code goes through that. So it does dead code elimination, it does true um, tree shaking, and some optimizations that uh, I've seen that from what I'm reading that Webpack hasn't gotten quite there yet in some aspects. Um, but again, Clojure actually works with Node and um, in that modules. They've done a lot of work to get that whole ecosystem to come back. So I think if you like writing Clojure, if you think this is a cool language, you could definitely use that as a target JavaScript or JVM language. Um, I probably I had to learn the server side Clojure for the talk today because I've been more focused on writing it on Node and uh, JavaScript Clojure script on on that and using Project Lambda. It's, it seems to me that the better option would be to run Clojure script on a node um, instance rather than using Lambda and node rather than Java. Um, just startup times, that sort of thing. I'm seeing, I'm seeing from as a system scripting language, Clojure is, is being used. I saw a great talk on that. Um, it's, it's being used at Walmart Labs um, for some other things. Um, Circle CI uses Clojure. Um, so it's, it's being adopted more and more. Again, it might not be the language that everything is using on, but if you know, if you get to learn it pretty well, um, one, you'll know a Lisp, um, it, and then you'll have some really easy intros into macros, which other languages, Groovy, I think, is trying to implement macros into that language. Um, Actually, so, that is out now. It's out, out now? Okay. So there's a lot of concepts that are here that have been around for a while that just, I think, were, for me, a little easier to 
pull in and work with. Um, so yeah, the so what is, for me, it was learning something new and, and applying that to the languages that I learned, uh, that I, I already learned, like Java, Groovy, um, Scala. Um, there were some things with Scala that this, like, oh, that's how, that's how it's done, and you know, just a different look at the same thing, different lens. Um, so, you know, one other, um, so I think one of the big pushes into functional programming is um, the idea that um, if you want to have um, high concurrency, um, so the problem with, um, you know, multi-threaded programming is um, if you have a uh, mutable state, then you're always going to be blocking, right? Mm -hmm. And because uh, you have to synchronize. So the key to having really fast code run um, multi-threaded and safe is to have immutable data. Mm -hmm. So the big, to me, the big value proposition in the language is um, it's a pure functional language that where everything's immutable by default. So you know you're going to have, and you and it implements software transactional memory. So um, you can't, you have to make a special effort in order to mutate anything. And the other thing that, that kind of goes with that is once you access something, you know it will stay um, uh, in that state for the duration that you're using it. So it's kind of it's implementing the same thing that, that Oracle does, the MD uh, multi version control. The, you know, so it's basically where people read. So it guarantees you where people read on a thread um, as long as, um, unless, you, unless you explicitly said I'm going to exchange this data. And then you get the, the essentially the same um, behavior and memory that you do in a database. So if I'm going to access a data structure, somebody opens up a transaction and changes that, and I'm in the middle of processing that, um, you'll actually, be, um, exceptions will be thrown because you've got, um, just like you would if you were trying to do a dirty read and you were expecting um, that data not to change. And so all of that stuff, I think to me, for me, that's, that's where, you know, you, you really want the strength of a compiler in a language that's going to guarantee that immutability. And you can code by convention in Java and Groovy and other languages, but the compiler doesn't guarantee that immutability. And, and in order to do that, then everything you said is true, right? You've got to change how you're going to think about algorithms. Yeah, um, yeah so the, the idea of an infinite list was, a new concept to me, um, you know, like what does that mean? And then learning about how that pattern gets developed. And you know, at first I thought, oh, there's going to be this huge overhead because it's copying, but it's done in a smart way. So digging in and learning about, oh, this is how they're applying data structures to make this immutable stuff happen. So there's a so lot. Go ahead. I'm, I'm going to boil, and I'm sure I'm going to boil way too much. But what I'm hearing between you is there's a a value in, I, I'm, in other words, I'm not trying to figure out what's the so what for you. I'm trying to figure out what's the so what for Walmart Labs or somebody. And what I'm hearing is concurrency yeah. to a large degree, concurrency attributes and uh, runtime. Uh, yeah, and there's a, there's also, um, I mean, lines of code. So you looked at some of those functions. Those those are just. Closure's philosophy is have few data structures and lots of functions around that manipulate those data structures. So I've, I haven't even chipped the tip of the iceberg on that. So uh, looking at those code examples, I mean, what you're writing in, in something, and it's more declarative, right? You're not having to say, what's this? Java's made huge improvements in that area. You know, you're doing your for each, and you're not doing for with a counter and that sort of thing. But if you look at the code, it's more declarative. Um, it speaks more, I think to me, it speaks more to the intent of what I want that to read. So there's not a bunch of boilerplate around that code. Again, um, if it's Clojure, if it's Elm or Haskell, a functional programming language, I think you'll see the F sharp. Um, you're you're going to see that conciseness because it's going to really apply the intent of what you're trying to do and not necessarily what the language is enforcing on you. Um, so, Sorry, you, Scott, you were going to. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I think I mean, that's really, that's what I see. So when you look at languages like Erlang, which is a lot of people think is maybe the, um, the epitome of a, a very performant, massively concurrent. So Erlang's notorious for, um, like in, in one uh, hosted uh, machine, having um, several million simultaneous connections to open, which, um, you know, we, we don't think about attempting to do that in, in most languages or runtime. And it does it, and it, and it, um, and it never crashes. Well, that's, it's written in a functional programming style, so everything's pure functions, everything's isolated in a process. And, and I think that's where the, you know, it's getting all of those uh, functional programming helps enable 
you to write. Well, you didn't mention testing, but of course that's part of the value to functional. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have all these great side effects, like what Juan was saying. It's kind of funny. You start diving into that style of coding if you're wondering about how to write concurrent code, and then you start realizing, wow, my code looks a lot different than it did before. It feels cleaner. It's easier to reason about. Yeah, I'm just pulling up some tests here. So all of the stuff I've put out there will have tests against it. This probably isn't the best one to show because it's a little more advanced. Um, it, it's, it's, there's a few different ways that core, um, sorry, the closure spec is one way. And I'm learning that, so I can't speak exactly to how that would work. But what you're used to with um, Spock and JUnit kinds of things are all testing concepts that have been proven that you can use something similar with enclosure. In this case, um, you know, this test says, here's the fact, then here's my test. Um, I mean, it's per it doesn't get much more complicated than facts and tests and stuff. You know, I would, I'm kind of flashing back to like 2011 and 12 too. There's some good talks by Rich Hickey on why he created enclosure. But um, like yeah. boiling it up at a high level. So he wanted something that would run on a JVM because he felt like, you know, for all, all the bashing on, about Java and JVM, it's still um, it's a world class runtime with, with, you know, world class garbage collection. Um, and it runs anywhere, basically, today. And you, so you've got, and you've got massive libraries. The other thing that's hard about a lot of functional programming languages is the pure functions are great until you start doing screen IO and data IO, like database IO, right? Then you've got to break that paradigm, and like in Haskell, that gets you know you start getting into monads, and it gets really um, hard. I think um, when Rich Hickey, no relation, uh, designed the language, he he, I mean, he kind of made a point of I want it to be performant. I want to be able to take advantage of all the libraries that are out there, and and when I have to do mutation, I want it to be easy. I want to, I, I don't want to have to jump through hoops. Um, to get something to a database or to get something to a screen. Yeah, and so um, earlier I said you, you can take most closure code and write it through uh, closure script. I actually did that. I showed you earlier the test cases of closure, and what I did was change the file extension because I, yeah, that's just what I did, and I pulled the whole thing over into the web library and ran it and didn't have any issues. Um, but what you typically would do is just name it with a CLJ C file. Um, and then that would mean that it could be used by both the Java, the Java, Java side and the JavaScript side. So I just did a quick and dirty thing because I, I, I haven't actually, again, I hadn't been working with both. I've been mostly doing the closure script stuff for my own stuff because I was running closure script on top of Phoenix. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. So we should probably wrap up. Good <laughs> question. Yeah. Let's follow up with questions afterwards, maybe. Okay. Yeah, we can go over DJs and get that done, and I'll answer. I'll stay for a while over there. Make sure we get over there and talk. So, thanks for the hook. Thanks.